Welcome to Run With It, where we bring you business ideas from proven founders. Each episode, you'll hear a new business idea and the exact steps our guests would take to get started. We're your hosts, Chris Justin. And Ethan Janney. And on today's episode, we have Alessandro Pepe and Lindsay Gabbard. Alessandro has done it all, documentaries, theater, opened multiple wine bars in Dublin, then returned back to Rome and ultimately was the mastermind behind Remessa Ruscioli, a wine bar and restaurant in Rome and that, and created the Ruscioli Wine Club and Community Wine. And Lindsay came to Italy five years ago when she was studying wine in the U.S. Uh, she came to Remessa Raschioli to do Alessandro's wine tasting, left in awe, felt it, fell in love, and ever since did a U-turn to get back. She now is a partner in the business and manages the Raschioli Wine Club along with partners Alessandro and Mattia. So welcome to the show, folks. Yeah, I hope I pronounced everything right. I was like in the middle of that. I was like, oh, yeah, it's Italian. <laughs> Rascioli. Rascioli, see? I'm an, Thank I'm you fool. for that correction. <laughs> uh, so I think that it's really important for us to start out by acknowledging that this is a first for the episode. We've got some wine that we are going to be sampling here throughout the conversation. This is going to be fun. Uh, it's 530 yeah. over there. It's a little bit more respectable for you guys to be drinking than 10:30 a.m. Pre noon here, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I am. Uh, I wish that I could be sampling some Rascioli wine, but right now I've got Yellowtail. So <laughs> don't 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 kill me for that. I can see Alessandro's face is just it's like one of my favorite doing? jokes during my tasting is about Yellowtail. Exactly. <laughs> You've got to tell it now. Uh, I used to start my taste. Welcome to everyone. Doesn't really matter if you're not a wine expert. Whatever you like, you you know. Even if you drink yellowtail, I'm sorry for you, but you can be here. That's what I. I that's when. That's my starting line. <laughs> <laughs> I will say that I typically drink better than yellowtail. Not to throw my mother-in-law to the bus, but I am at her place, and this is what I've got. So <laughs> that's, well, that, that's, uh, that's what we're doing. Example with. now, why? What, what is actually our goal? You were asking about what is our mission, and you know, to help uh, people like you stop drinking that stuff. You know? <laughs> nice, <laughs> it's a really mission. Nice. And I was sent by Dionysus, which is actually one of the oldest god. <laughs> Uh, registered in the mythology, you know, and I think I'm the prophet that is spreading the word about, you know, stop uh, drinking industrial wine and getting back to using wine as a cultural vehicle. And uh, that is the main issue of Rimessa Roscioli, and uh, that is the main issue of our wine club. <laughs> I would love to try get, to get the mic sound of me pouring my it. wine. Yeah, Ethan's got his full bottle through? going there. Yeah, it definitely is. Nice. So yeah, noble mission. We will get into that. I want to frame this up for the listener. This episode is a little bit different. Normally, we interview business owners and ask them to share a new business idea that they have. Occasionally, this is the second time that I believe that we're doing this, we will dive into an existing business and try and unpack it in terms of uh, growth opportunities and things that we can do uh, to help existing successful business owners get more customers and and grow and achieve the goals that they're seeking. So Lindsay and Alessandra, you are so generous to be able to show us inside your business and you're going to be so generous to do that. And we are going to kick around some ideas with you to help the wine club and the community that you've got grow. It would be really helpful to frame this in terms of the impact of the pandemic. You have a very well-known restaurant in Rome I imagine that has lost a good bit of business. Just how how deeply has the, the pandemic affected you and in what ways in terms of revenue and employees and everything like that? I, I wanted to say one thing really quickly. Being American and living in Italy, the first thing that really, really shocked me was how quick Italians are to come together when it you know, when a pandemic happens. So, you know, the, the first thing I feel like you think of in the US is okay, we've got to cut costs. Here it was how do we save the employees? It was a completely different shift. And really, we have 27 employees that we have to personally, 30 now, actually. We've hired, <laughs> we've hired a few, actually, even during the pandemic, which doesn't ever usually happen. But uh, that was the first uh, issue we had, was how do we save the entire team? If they were to leave, you know, or we were to let them go, where would they go? There was nowhere. So it was immediately the mission was to save everybody. And that's where we got the idea to really start to working on uh, community.wine. 
you two are obviously very positive, which is, <laughs> it must be a testament to you uh, or a reflection of your success there. I do want to dive a little bit deeper into the the low part that you were facing, and it would be great if you don't mind sharing some well, you uh, want to hear some, some numbers. Story. It can be percentage. Right. I, I want to hear. Well, yeah. I want to hear. How did bad you, did it get? Did you did you lose? When did you, you know, cry? Sixty percent of your cry? revenue. <laughs> I have to say that you know the main issue was a psychological and sociological issue, a uh, psychosociological was um, uh, it is about dealing with all my employees and speaking with them and trying to maintain. Uh, a decent uh, amount of rationality. Uh, we've lost, uh, Bo, I think, um, 600000 probably $700,000, probably. We, we didn't gain it. But, uh, but the, the, the good news is uh, I am a rich uh, entrepreneur that has no money. Uh, I never have money in my pocket. <laughs> I mean, my bank account never, have more, never has more than $500, never. No matter if I gain twenty thousand dollars a month or five hundred, so there was no, I, I didn't hear any feel any difference. I don't have a car, I don't have a Ferrari, I don't buy. I always all my money is to offer people drink and and buy books and, and, buy books and travel. That's it. And I reinvest all my money, <laughs> so I'm free. I don't. I, I this is a thing. and I can some week somehow became kind of rich only in the last two three years. So. I was not even used to it, you know. I, I remember one of the first tasting I did. I don't even know what was the name. He was the he was on the board of Facebook uh, uh, in 2006, and he was the one that started Zuckerberg to build up Facebook. I think he's a billionaire right now. And he said I became billionaire like in in five weeks. He said, uh, and and then he said I don't know what to do. I still want, when I go to the hotel, I still will watch wash my my socks in the sink because I don't want to spend the money. <laughs> <laughs> but they want so, that's funny. Well, if, you want, if you want the real numbers, also uh, business, I would say is down for is probably down about sixty percent for us. 70, 65 percent. Sixty five. We used to do two hundred thousand dollars a month, and now we are no well, actually. Now we're going back. Like we're going around nine hundred, ninety thousand. That's the restaurant mainly that we're speaking. That's the restaurant. Wine Club is doing quite well, right. but we used to grow. We were four hundred members in September last year, and at the end of the year we were eight hundred members, and now we're we gain only a hundred members in the last year. So we were, you know, projecting to go to three, four thousand members, five thousand members, and boom, everything was blocked. And now I said, why don't we invest all our energy? To understand this strange ocean of shit that is the social media, <laughs> uh, and uh, we're trying to understand how do we, you know, make virtual our uh, real experience. I I'm going to throw in my, our first little kind of yeah. mind shift here. I think interesting because uh, you said your idea is how do you make your kind of live wine experience virtual, right? That's yeah. something you're aiming for, mm -hmm. and I think that that's a really great aspiration because you probably have such a great live experience but one thing that we can talk about and think about today what i've noticed is some of the online projects that i've done it's more it's less about making it more like the live experience and more about taking advantage of the non-live experience you know so for example i do some master classes online uh, in the piano industry where people learn how to fix pianos take care of pianos right and of course, it's easy to think, well, I need to go apprentice with someone and sit there right next to them in person and learn from them or take a class where I get to sit in the same room with them. But now we found there's interesting advantages to having a remote learning. You can rewatch something instead of having to pay attention exactly live and take notes on what's happening. You can get a closer look at things if you're in a, if you're in a group of people and uh, you're trying to learn uh, from one person and you're all in the same room, really only one or two people get an upfront seat. Whereas if you've got a video camera up front, everybody's watching from a distance, you can see things. So those are advantages of doing things remotely in that particular project. And in addition, I'm not saying not to think about ways to do things live uh, or to bring that live experience to, to the web, but also think about, oh, what are now the advantages that we have? One of them, of course, is just the access global access all of a sudden you have which i think is amazing yeah really the biggest sorry to interrupt you i just <laughs> want to kind of throw that in there really the like we were saying before the biggest issue is that of course our 3d experience 
uh, was extremely memorable for people. They were traveling. We we speak about wine in quite a different way than your typical sommelier does. And so when people leave, their minds are open. I mean, for me, I literally, like I said, did a U-turn and came right back uh, to Italy because of this place, because to me, it spoke to me. It spoke to the deep of my heart uh, and what I cared about with wine, which was kind of going beyond the bottle. Uh, but yeah, really trying to take what we have, we're starting to do a bit more with videos. I'm practicing because for me, I'm not as good at this, uh, but we're starting to try to use more videos to try to bring this, you know, bring the 3D experience a bit more virtually, but that's definitely the issue is that, you know, our signups for the wine club, of course, will be lower for the mere fact that we don't have, we don't have visitors uh, in our restaurant at the moment. I think we'll start peppering in some suggestions for things that you can do, but before we get to that, it would be helpful to, uh, to describe what you've tried so far in a little bit greater detail. Uh, so just to reiterate, you have two main online businesses or online aspects to your business. There's the Wine Club, uh, which is doing a decent amount of revenue, and you've been able to uh, to stave off some of the, the uh, issues that you face with the, the restaurant via the Wine Club. And then community.wine, it's an online educational platform for people to learn more about wine. So those are the two assets that you have that you're looking to leverage more to, to make up for lost ev- revenue through the mm-hmm. restaurant. Exactly. Yeah. In terms of getting those things started, was there anything else that you tried and, and you decided to toss it to the side or any other ideas that... I think we did everything. <laughs> we did everything possibly we did. We, we we did that. we did live uh, art auction we did uh, tastings all over the world we went came to new york uh, to san francisco after after that in these three months uh, we did five streamings in lange uh, within the barolo area with five different winemakers uh, we created a group of seven eight people to make a kind of a think tank we started to study Neuromarketing, neuroscience, and neuromarketing, digital marketing, philosophy, misbehaving from Richard Thaler. We uh, had the idea of uh, of creating a wine school here at the restaurant directly with streaming of this wine school. Uh, we are promoting the wine club also in Italy, which is kind of a strange thing because Italians they don't even know what is a wine club. Uh, we are trying to create a virtual. Um, we are thinking about uh, involving wine students and uh, young sommelier, especially restaurants at the moment are not working hard. They are not working for the COVID. It's about why don't you train your team with us? So why don't you train your team and so that your staff can learn about wine in this easy, efficient, communicative way? Because our way of teaching wine is the opposite, upside down, what they do in Corto Master Sommelier, WSAT, Italian Sommelier Association. All these schools, they teach you how to, you know, all the technical and scientific part of the wine based on the concept that there is actually a predetermined idea of taste, which is not. There is nothing more fluid and empiric than wine. And the main issue is about that there is no point to learn everything about wine. And when you are beyond two minutes at the table to speak with a customer that usually drink yellowtail, I'm joking, but <laughs> so <laughs> the main issue is about what you have to learn as a sommelier, as a waiter, you have to learn, you know, the few things that, that are actually related with stories, but not just because they're more entertaining, because they are actually the meaning of wine is not its technical data. So that's the thing. It's about I was thinking about this be- beautiful future in which I was able to get to four or five thousand members, which means becoming the first. At the moment, I am surely the first. We are the first peer to peer wine export of Italy, maybe the second or first. I think we are the first right now. But if we get to 5,000 members, it means that, that we can coordinate the majority of artisan wine of Italy. And Italy is the first the biggest uh, wine producer in the world with France sometimes and so on. So it means that with not a lot of, you know, with a business that is four or five million dollars, you technically are directing a business that is billion of dollars because that's how wine works i'll share the story of uh Solos, how it worked with well, for champagne. example for example champagne okay champagne is uh, uh 305 million bottles but who directs the market of champagne there used to be one two players moet tennessee louis vuitton moet tennessee and few others we're talking about boulanger but not really boulanger because it's actually james bond but it's bev clico dom perignon and few others 
at the end of the 80s, a guy called Celos started to do a specific artisan type of champagne. There used to be a lot of artisan, beautiful champagne, but nobody knew about them. You have to go in a, in a, in a little, you know, fancy Michelin restaurant to find those champagne. You don't know it. You don't know this, this type of champagne. If you drink yellow, tail, you know, I'm going back to that. But I'm going to use you as an example. Okay, thank you for, <laughs> for supporting this. So we have a big ambition. Think about Napa Valley. Napa Valley, 99% of Napa Valley wine production is mainly made in the cellar. What does that mean? That you could actually make that wine no matter where the grape comes from. Why? Because they overripe and they use a lot of oak. Guess what? Napa Valley is probably one of the best wine regions in the world for climate and soil. And it makes no sense why they do that, because it's easier, because that's the market. You know, you are used to that kind of Napa. And if you go to Matthias and if you go to Arno Roberts or like uh, Kaplinger, they are just a little lost, beautiful winemaker. They have, you know, they make a, a astonishing terroir wines. I'm, I'm, I'm joking about yellowtail, but what's the problem of yellowtail? Yellowtail, it doesn't taste of the soil, doesn't taste of the land, it tastes of the smart of the enologist that in the cellar is able to put some powder in it. So it's like a beverage that tastes like wine. Maybe it's beautiful, but it's the Coca-Cola. I call it the chicken McNuggets of wine. You know, there's that type of wine and it tastes always the same, which the beauty of wine that it makes you travel with your palate. So creative community of these small artisan is about creating a sort of a geography of flavors. The specific tactic uh, that I think that just, you pretty much did it here is, uh, you know, Italian winemaker explains why you should never drink yellowtail. You can record a video with that, just your rant, right? That could, that's something that has potential to go viral, not guaranteed, but if it does, if you want to learn how to appreciate wine that's better than yellowtail, go to community.wine and we'll teach you what you need to, to appreciate. You can record that. It'd be a two minute video, right? It'd be entertaining for Americans because we, you have the accent, the passion is there. And also to someone, I, drank a decent amount of wine in my life, but, and I can tell, I don't like this as much as other wines that I've had, but I can't tell you why I can say that it's a little bitter. It makes my stomach a little upset drinking yellowtail, but, but I don't really know why I can't pinpoint it. And if you can make it so that I feel smarter and I can explain to people, Oh, yellowtail is no good because this, this, and this, and you can explain that to me in two minutes, you've got me hooked that I'm, I'm going to start saying, Oh, this is, you know, it's not just this hoity-toity thing to become a small yay. I'm going to have to take hours and hours of classes. You've provided that value in two minutes for me, as I said. One, my one other big challenge I should mention uh, was, you know, the fact that our community.wine project is it's set up to be a global type of a project. It started mainly with Italians and Americans, simply because those are kind of our two or you know bigger markets. Uh, and so the, the common language was English, but having a double language uh, is a bit of a challenge for us because right now we are not using multi-language on the site for the mere fact that Buddy, brought, Buddy Press, the platform we use, has one glitch in which, like I said, the answers uh, for our quizzes cannot be done in both languages. So that's really a, something that we're, we're struggling with because the Italians think it's all in English, the uh, Americans think it's all in Italian. And that's, I think, partially something where we're, we need to kind of get over that obstacle and to really move forward properly, uh, where users feel comfortable and safe where they are, where they understand. I think we suffer from uh, a lack of rationality sometimes as well, which can, we suffer more with the American market for that fact. If we go too rational though, we start to lose the Italian market. And so finding the way to navigate through that challenge <laughs> is one of our biggest you ones. Do you think Italians are irrational? No. <laughs> 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 From my point of view, I don't think U.S. Are, Americans are really irrational. No, we're probably, yeah. <laughs> After COVID, I don't think Italians are more irrational than Americans. But anyway, this is my just... <laughs> Well, Alessandra, Alessandra, calm down. You're getting irrational. Come on. <laughs> you know, in terms of other things we've tried, uh, mainly we are using our MailChimp list uh, as our main marketing source. We have not really ever invested much in Facebook ads and in uh, any type of ads with Google or anything, simply because we've never really had great results. Uh, I don't know if it wasn't good marketing people before, but, you know, the idea of just throwing a ton of money at that we're kind of cautious before we, we go down that road, but that's something we really haven't explored properly. 
our main thing is we are kind of working on the more of the Seth Godin technique, which is finding your tribes. So we know who our tribes are. They're wine students, they're, res you know, they're uh, restaurant owners, they're sommeliers, wine passionates. And so we, we need to, I think, start to utilize our tribes more and utilize our current members and people like this more to help us spread the word. One thing I'll throw in there just that's been interesting, you know, the, the boat, I don't think the boat is completely left on this just because we're still dealing with the pandemic and quarantine. Anything that you could do to support uh, individuals that are in the same situation, right, of, of kind of... Um, you know, folks that are sommeliers or restaurant owners or, or whatnot, and they're trying to figure out, hey, what do we do right now? Mm -hmm. And just getting them together, maybe bringing, bringing them experts or people who seem to have some things to talk about on the topic. That's an interesting way to go with that trying to commu create that community, I think. Well, you had mentioned that, that one of the opportunities that you talked about is uh, for restaurants that are under, underserved right now, having their sommeliers come and help with your platform a little bit. So it, it sounds like you're you're trying that out. Regarding the dual language challenge, that to me seems like an almost trivial technical solution. Uh, like if you could, I don't know, throw throw five thousand dollars at it, something it's not gonna be a crazy amount of money to to solve that and just create videos in, in both Italian and in English. Uh, maybe that's not a perfect solution right now, but at least you can see which market it takes off with more. I don't know how many videos that you have in your platform, but as you're describing creating content that's in between the two, you're right now you're for no one because the Italians don't want you because you're not Italian enough and the Americans don't want you because you're too irrational. <laughs> so if you can separate it and create create both pieces, you may find one that's a winner and you get to focus on that more down the line, but uh, definitely don't want to be in the middle where people can say, no, you're not for me, where both camps can say, no, you're not for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's definitely a trend of of kind of niching down as far as possible and, and reaching a, a specific market. So, you know, right now you have community.wine. I don't think you could get this domain, but it's not it's not whatever community is in, in Italian dot vino, right? I mean, it's it's community.wine and you could you could focus on an English English market English speaking market and let Italians that can understand it and participate, go ahead and do that. But by focusing in on a market that, you know, is very clear and maybe even, you know, even beyond just an American market, a specific type of American, right? Whether it's, you know, you could even go as deep as, is it restaurant owners or is it sommeliers, you know? We had a job offer for a chief marketing officer. We had at the moment, 450 requests of people uh, because we need a guy or a, a strategist or a woman or uh, that you know give us a strategy to all the things we do. We we are still trying to figure out the way to get the out. We know that we need to work with people that are close to us and start there and let the idea spread. But a, a way to kind of grow our uh, our email base and our i mean we have our of course we can find our own friends emails and things and our rest you know, who own restaurants and, and things like this but to go beyond that and to start to find uh wine student emails we're really struggling to so we've used facebook groups that are interested in wine and we've posted there but we do know that of course facebook at not facebook ads but facebook uh posts get to like five percent of people so potentially people don't even see them but we've kind of used facebook as a, a means to kind of put posts there but that's really a struggle is we're, you know, to try to find uh, emails. To and to go really straight, we have a 50,000, 40,000 e profiled emails. We have like with all the, our things, uh, maybe 30,000 followers, 40,000 followers, 300 videos, 400 winemakers that follow us. Uh, we have emails of a lot of students and so on. Uh, we have like 900 wine club members. So we have affiliate programs. How do we create, at the moment we do two, three subscription per day. How do we make it five, six, seven per day? I don't think it's impossible. You know, maybe I get in touch with this, the digital marketing smart guys and they say, and they tell me so terrible things. And we do this, this you know, we pay this money that brings nowhere. And at the, at the end, they're just using our main list. You know, I've seen, I, I gave you 70 members of the wine club with a my campaign. Yeah, but that was my contact, not yours. You didn't do anything. You just sent an email so, that was on, actually, though. I'm um, talking about an, an experience. So to clarify what, what our issue was also, 
we really wanted to reach out and try to find, we used a company to, that created a funnel for us and they promised that they were going to have all these great results. We told them to focus on non risholi contacts. So they were focusing on bringing in new, you know, new lead generation for us. Uh, unfortunately, that didn't work out so well. But the, one of the worst things about a lot of these digital marketing groups and such is that they, we have a brand that has authenticity. That is probably the best thing we have going. It is for sure the best thing we have going for us. And we don't want to sell this. And so that's really, really important to us going forward with, with a marketing strategy is to not fall into a, a mass promoted product like Coca-Cola and someone who's selling t-shirts and things like this. So we really were trying to you know, promote our wine club in the EU to other people that didn't know us also because the EU is much easier for us to ship in case anything ever happens with uh, import export with US, we were a little bit more protected. So trying to develop this concept in the EU is really important to us as well. Yeah, I think that makes sense. And this is a good action step for the listener out there who uh, may have some experience with the marketing, create a marketing plan and outline what these guys should do. You, you just lay it all out there. This is do this first month, you know, second month, they've got this year plan. You heard about some of the pitfalls that they faced in the past. You heard about the budget that they have and the authenticity, things that they're aiming to accomplish. So take that and and create a plan for uh, these guys. We are also interviewing for this. So it may be a position that we could even hire from. We are willing to even work abroad with somebody. We're not necessarily focused on working with an Italian only. To, to They don't have to be local. Uh, but that's something that we're interested in possibly is hiring someone for maybe a three, four month period of time to really uh, work beside us and strategize uh, on e-commerce and, and marketing strategies. Yeah, I want to bring in something now. This isn't something you guys have to do, but maybe from talking about the advantages, you know, we could get, get somewhere interesting. And, you know, one big trend right now is, is podcasting itself, right? We're on a podcast right now. Chris and I have a podcast. I run a group where we talk about starting and growing podcasts as well. And the, the interesting thing about podcasting um, is that you, you can have a lot of advantages at the same time without, uh, without a lot of expense. It's like, it's like a, it's like its own advantage. Like we were telling you before we started the show, it's like, Oh, what is this part of what's the major business? We're like, well, we're kind of just doing it for free because we get to meet you, you know, you're awesome. And we have a great excuse to drink a glass of wine and have a good conversation about business and, and so one thing that I keep thinking back to in this, that you want to sort of be an influencer even more, you already are a little bit of an influencer within your community, be even more of an influencer and actually get attraction. Like, so people feel like they have a reason to pay attention and a reason to engage with you. And those are two great things uh, that you can get out of podcast, right? You can say, Hey, yeah, I know you, you have a restaurant, you know me, I know you, but instead of just saying, Hey, I have got this thing, go just log in and do something non-interactive and try it out come let's have a conversation you know we'll record it and we'll put it out there for other people who are working on their business you know and you can share whatever insights that are that are going on for you with wine with business the pandemic all this stuff and then it it the audience then can also participate and that's that's again we've been experimenting with it hasn't worked as much in this a project, but in other projects, I'll actually have a bunch of people in on a Zoom call. You know, we have like 50 to 100 people on a Zoom call, and they're just kind of enjoying nerding out on whatever topic it is, just kind of being there, having a place to, um, to hang out. And, and it gives you an excuse to meet and brainstorm and determine the future of the industry, really, with other people that you respect. And also, have that influence where other people go, that's great. And then beyond that, if the people who are watching and uh, as participants find value in it, it can be a source of revenue. And this becomes what people are talking about. So I don't know if I'm not telling you guys to start a podcast, although you know it's really fun to talk with you on a podcast, but maybe there's some lessons to learn from that um, to bring to the community. I, I think an even simpler way of starting that, I think that would be a, a great thing to get through, but you can even start a uh, Instagram or YouTube series where it's Alessandro drinks yellowtail or Alessandro drinks whatever this bottle of wine. Uh, not the entire thing. I don't know how fast to drink wine. Probably <laughs> Alessandro's not, not going to drink yellowtail, Chris. You've already established <laughs> I this. But no, I mean, this... well, you start up, but you do that, and then you can explain. Okay, this is I'm taking the sip. This is what I'm thinking as I'm drinking. This is what I'm noticing, and you have that so that people are seeing 
that experience. And if you want to get more of this, you want to learn how to appreciate wine the way that Alessandro appreciates it, join us at community.wine. You'll, it's completely free. You'll get this palette and be able to understand uh, what you should be looking for when you're drinking wine. Uh, so one question that I wanted to ask you is overall, who is the ideal person who's going to come into community.wine? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I can tell you who it would be a person like myself. So I was studying wine without a compass. I was basically just assuming that if I took more classes and gained more technical knowledge and more, um, more understanding of wine, that that was the answer. It took me coming to Italy to really understand really what wine could be all about. And to me, wine has just been the medium for me to understand things on a deeper level. So for his, you know, history, for example, for me was, it was hard for me to place things. But when I started to learn more about wine and when, uh, you know, with Hitler, what he was doing with wine back in World War II, suddenly other things started making sense for me. But I used wine as the medium and the vehicle. So I think someone who's just curious, who's who likes wine, who has passion for wine, but maybe isn't, doesn't have passion for the alcohol in it, like which, is, which was where I was. I didn't care so much about getting drunk or anything like that. I just found that behind wine, there was story, there was uh, a way to travel differently. There was, it brought you to a countryside. And so people who are curious and who love wine, but know that there's something more behind it, but they just don't know what it is. That's kind of the person. What happened with Hitler and so forth? <laughs> <All the friends. laughs> Hitler was a non-drinker. Hitler didn't drink alcohol at all. Uh, he was so it that's a good that's a good point to promote our wine club. <laughs> <laughs> neither, neither do uh, some other influential uh, political figures. Um, I would, uh, or at least claim. Uh, let's say. So I just wanted to say, um, gosh, what was it? Oh. Well, instead of taking this direction of saying who is the ideal client for um, community.wine, question who is already, like, who's the most enthusiastic of everyone there? Is there one person? Is there five people? Like, uh, you know, who are the people that are already there and what are the defining characteristics? You have any thoughts on that? Uh, a few of the people that show up more frequently, uh, we have a few of our wine club members that became community members. We also have a, a group of winemakers. There are probably about five or six winemakers that consistently post on there and uh, respond. But um, I don't know that I could profile them more more specifically. No. We need to say community of wine at the moment is a kind of a strange, dark, dead place. I mean, it's not really working. I mean, there are 1,200 people getting there, but there's not really a lot of interaction. Uh, How well do you know those those five to six winemakers that post? By and all, they're all friends. We, so we, we have like at least, uh, I would say, 70, 80 winemakers that, you know, we became friends. Rochelle is a big name. They... We've been selling a lot of their wines during the years. They came here tons of times. We have a winemaker week here coming here usually. At the rest. Yeah. Not in this time maybe, but you know, actually from this, from next to Sunday, yes. Every week there will be a winemaker here. So they're all friends. I think you got a great opportunity actually to, to not focus on the people who need to learn about wine as much as the, the winemakers. You've already got relationships with them. Yeah. Other other nice factor, although there may be some variation in this in the pandemic, but is that they're they're winemakers, you know, so they're already invested in the large project project. So in terms of monetizing a community, if you didn't want to monetize a community like that, to say, oh hey, there's a subscription to be part of this group and it's fifty bucks a month, a hundred bucks a month, whatever it is, it doesn't sound like a lot to a winemaker who has a vineyard and they're paying, you know thousands of tens of thousands of dollars a month and whatever mortgages on the property or something like that. So it might be interesting to see like who's there already, who's already has like kind of like an ex again, it may be small, but an excitement enough to say, I wanted to put some posts up here. Why did you want to put some posts up here? What was your goal? Oh, maybe I wanted to, even if it was the goal of putting posts there to get people to try and drink their wines and maybe you're not attracting those people to the site anymore, but maybe you're kind of creating this sort of community with them and saying, hey, we're going to meet, we're going to have this wine community, we're going to open to the public, other people can join, that we're going to start to become, work together to become the influencers in this market. And it will be a no-brainer for you to pay to be part of this community um, or contribute to it or whatever the ask is from them because of the value you're going to get out of the kind of group, the group effort of it, you know, the group output. 
So in the interest of uh, creating some tension here, I'm going to disagree completely with Ethan on, on that recommendation. I'm going to have, uh, I'm going to pull myself another glass. I here. know you're going to need it for this smackdown. <laughs> I'm going to put on here. Um, the, uh, what Ethan is describing there is, is a little bit of creating a two-sided marketplace where you have both the the winemakers coming in and the uh, as, aspiring students who are going to learn from each other and the winemakers can sell to those students. So the winemakers may pay some money to be part of that community. I think that it would make more sense to uh, focus almost exclusively on the aspiring students and try and get them into your wine club directly. And you've already... Um, in our pre-interview call, I was surprised that you didn't highlight this more, but uh, during the, the videos for Community.Wine, part of the educational content, it, you really benefit from having the wines that are part of your club as you're going through the learning material exactly. in Community.Wine. So there's a certain percentage of people who are just going to want to do it, a, a large percentage of people that just want to do it for free. Uh, but some people who, who are really getting into it are going to want to order the wine and uh, learn more that was you know, cool. hands-on with the real material. Real, that was the right? goal. So yeah, was no. exactly to... Do you... Exactly. What percentage of people who are members of Community.Wine start out in Community.Wine and then become a subscriber of the club? I have no clue. Zero. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, like we well, you said no, it was... The, some of it, it was the other way around, right? Our, some of the subscribers became members of the of the community it's right? a two-way street so no no it actually it's it's kind of a circle so some of our as soon as someone becomes a wine club member they get an automated mailchimp um an automation basically that comes out that tells them that we have this community and there's a wine school where they can learn more about the wines that are in the wine club and on the opposite side of that fabio amore one of our our most recent wine club signups was a heavily active community member who just signed up for the wine club so it actually the, one. the goal <laughs> one for sure. No, no, we. Do, I need to try to find no, a way to no, get no. into Mailchimp to figure no, out. We had the data. a seventy-eight. It's, I personally, to me, I perceive that in a complex business like ours, sometimes we see these waves coming, boom, of things, of people. We don't know where they come from. We try to track them. Uh, maybe there was an article, like, for example, it happened, an article on New York Times or Carbonara with Salumeria, so that one actually gave a lot of, you know, or Anthony Bourdain that came at Trimesa, for example, like uh, 10 years ago, that boom, at a certain point, I received this. Way. But uh, most of the time, I think it's a complex amount of things. We did community wine, we did some videos, 12 articles came out with the different newspaper in, in Italy, and we had this affiliate program. So... One uh, positioning idea that jumps to mind for me is, uh, especially now during this pandemic, it's very topical to have uh, a replacement date night, right? My wife and I, we can't, we're not going to go out to a restaurant as we, uh, as we did before. But if we have a, a nice bottle of wine and we have this video to guide us through the experience, it's almost a replacement uh, sommelier that we can do anytime, uh, that sort of positioning is attractive. And if you can sell it as, you know, you have six dates uh, a husband who doesn't do well at planning dates. Here's six that you have that are uh, pre-planned for you that we're going to guide you. We'll give you some advice on the food to order during this time too. And you have that entire thing planned. Uh, your wife is going to love it. Uh, the concept that comes to mind for me as you're describing the community.wine and the wine club is the, the flywheel, uh, Jim Collins concept, where you have a, a positive feedback loop where more members in one group feeds more members in the other, and it just continues that's on. Yeah, that's uh, it. There may be opportunities to find out from those individuals what is it that turned you over the edge, sure. right? And and that's individual conversations with those people. They would love the chance to talk to the two of you, right? If they, if they haven't already had that opportunity, the people who are most engaged in the community dot wine, they would love the chance to have a a fifteen minute. Uh, personalized consultation yeah, and you I'm just gonna, understand I'm call people. No, I was thinking about to do uh, a, a tasting challenge involve all our uh, wine club members uh, to open a bottle of the wine club all together I need to see which platform can do it but to try to do the biggest tasting biggest ever like having 300 awesome. people yeah. all over the world at the same time talking about the wine club and everything that was the thing. Yeah. You can do that on Zoom. That You can have yeah. up to 300 people right there. People are looking for... So this is an incredible opportunity. People are looking for 
social connection opportunities. They don't have the ability to go out and do a wine tasting with a bunch of strangers. They they like to go with their friends, but they don't have the opportunity to do that. I know early on in the pandemic, we would play games online, but that got boring relatively quickly. If you gave me the chance to do a wine tasting with six of my friends all across the country and we can come in together and we can you know sit the wine and you talk us through it, uh, that could be a premium thing that you do. You you could have a free version, but you could have you could charge a decent amount for that. So depending on how tech you want to go, first of all, if you if you wanted to set something up on Zoom, sell tickets, get people to sign up. I've had a little bit to drink, but I'll I'll help you guys with that if you need help because <laughs> uh, I've been setting up online online meetings. I don't think I'll go back on that. But um, what I wanted to add though is depending on how deep you want to get into sort of the technical cutting edge, right? And for the listener, it might be interesting to hear what some of the possibilities are. Um, there's a software that is just, it may not even go anywhere. It's so fresh. Um, it's really cheap at the moment. It's called Topia.io. It's like Zoom, but people can go and congregate in little groups. And that is actually really cheap at the moment because they just invented it. It's not super high quality in terms of the video, but it doesn't really matter because of the sort of interesting factor. So that's what I was thinking about with Chris saying like, oh, I want to have a little group of people, my friends, but you could have a group where there's like thousands of people, but his group of five friends could go over and do their wine tasting together, but then come back to like a main group to listen to what you had to say about it, which is kind of interesting. But the other thing that comes to mind for me here is, I, I hate to use the term influencer marketing, but I wonder how often if you were to send a case of, of this wine to certain celebrities, if you send it to a hundred of them, you're almost guaranteed to get one hit and they have a million followers. And you, I, I don't know if that, that we thought pays about, out, we thought but about it, yeah. We're, we're considering yeah, it, yeah. yeah. I mean, we don't know how to yeah. necessarily reach the celebrities exactly, but... Um... You know who jumps... The, the first person that jumps to mind, he's not super... He's not maybe a, the celebrity, but... Uh, the San Antonio Spurs coach, look him up, Greg Popovich. Greg Popovich, he has an incredible palate. He's very uh, famous yeah. for that. He'll go and buy hundreds of thousands of dollars of wine at, at any restaurant. So if you could get one of his players, uh, Chris Paul is probably connected to someone like that. If you can get back in front of him and get in front of Greg Popovich, you were you were on your way. <laughs> <laughs> You're already on your way. Um, so I gotta have to ask this for our for for our listener who is. You know, we're, we're more in the business realm, right? And Gary V is kind of oh, the yeah. first person that comes to mind when I think of like wine, business, all this oh, stuff. Yeah. And I don't even know what he looks like from the perspective of an actual, you know, restaurant, actual people dealing with wine on a day to basis. Is that somebody that you you would seek to align yourselves with or you wouldn't even bother? Gary or, Vanderchuk. Um, yeah, Gary. Yeah. So, I mean, he's viral, of course. He's got a, a different way of speaking about wine that's a, a probably more in alignment with us than a lot of other people are. Even uh, Madeline uh, Phuket from from uh, Wine Folly. I mean, Wine Folly is maybe not our, our exact. They're a bit more like Wine 101. They're great for kind of really early on people that are interested in just really starting with the basics. But she does some playful things with her video. She was licking rocks to describe how, you know, the taste of rock, literally like <laughs> licking rocks and describing it. But yeah, Gary Vanderchuk, he's got a, he could be an interesting, he, he's got a business sense. I don't know if he, I think he has his own wine club though. So there may be, I mean, in terms of him promoting us, I don't wow. know that there might be a, a conflict of interest there, but he's, he's a guy that if you can get him speaking about your thing, he, he's got a big following of listening. I mean, just, just to, spitball a little bit further on like the biggest wine tasting in the world right ever right, yeah, right. The online first and biggest online wine tasting right it's like featuring you know you guys uh right, gary v yeah. um madeline Pucat, you know and then they each come up and they bring a wine or two right. and they offer them to the people and then not only does each of each one of them bring some attention to the event um, but you get to cross pollinate exactly. each other's message lists and, nice. and audiences. And, and if you're yeah, virtual you run events huge like right that, now, yeah, we are coming up on time here. We are over time actually. Okay. <laughs> so we really appreciate the conversation <laughs> with you guys. It's a huge opportunity. Of course, you can feel that passion coming from you. So the listener out there who agrees with this, uh, take some action, create that business plan for these guys. What are some of the things that they can do to grow the wine club, grow community.wine, and you know, make it through this pandemic better than before and be that 
tip of the spear when it comes to Italian winemaking and an appreciation of food, this vision that Lindsay and, and Alessandro are describing here. Thank you guys very much for the conversation. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Hi, see you to, for the biggest tasting in the world, okay? I'm so excited for it. It'll be a ton of fun. And next time we'll have better wine than uh, the hotel. <laughs> to the listener out there, thanks for joining us. We'll see you back with our regularly scheduled programming next week. And until then, run with some business ideas. <laughs> <laughs>